welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Drexel University Picture Gallery. Today our guest is James J. Collins, university professor as well as co-director and founder of the Center for Biodynamics at Boston University. Dr. Collins is a pioneer in the development of nonlinear dynamic devices to improve biological function. This is an exciting but complex area of research that he's going to try to explain to us in the next half hour. Dr. Collins is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Rhodes Scholarship, a MacArthur Genius Award, and most recently, the Anthony J. Drexel Award for Excellence. James Collins, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, I, will, I know that you specialize in nonlinear systems. And traditionally, I guess science has been focused, or in the past, on linear systems, which I understand have to do with the idea that the parts can be studied um, in order to understand the whole. Whereas in nonlinear systems, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. Is this right? Could you explain a little further so, the difference? Yeah, so th that's, that's one way you could characterize it. Okay. So one of the key differences is that in a linear system, you can very readily predict what the output will be or how the system will behave on the basis of the inputs. So for example, a linear gumball machine would be one if you put a dollar in and you got two gumballs out, you would expect if you put two dollars in, you'd get four gumballs out. Okay. But if it were nonlinear, you would have, in this case, one dollar, you'd get two gumballs out. But two dollars, you might get 13 gumballs back. Okay. So that the relationship between the input and output is no longer what would be a linear relationship. Traditionally, in engineering, we teach students to study linear systems, primarily because we can actually study those easier. <laughs> the, the mathematics are easier. The techniques are more relevant. But most things out in the real world are actually nonlinear. And so there, I think there was a quote, it might have been Stanislaw Ulam, who said to really refer to the study of nonlinear science is like saying zoology is a study of non-elephants. That in <laughs> fact, most things are nonlinear. And what we've seen in the last two decades is the introduction of novel techniques that actually allow us to begin to piece out the underlying structure of these nonlinear systems. So nature is generally nonlinear. That's right. And the human body and the human organism and so forth. That's right. So to study those things, we need different tools than the ones that would be in traditional simpler That's sort right. of science. That's right. And so what's happened in the last two decades is that techniques from physics and mathematics that were developed primarily in the 1980s have now been shifted into the applied areas of engineering, bioengineering, biology. Most of it was spawned by efforts with computers. Mm. So whereas earlier engineering techniques, you wanted to be able to solve something pencil and paper, with nonlinear equations, it was very difficult to actually solve the equations. Linear, you could come out with a solution. But computers allowed us to actually analyze much more complicated systems. And as a result, techniques were developed primarily in the, the mathematical arena and physics arena that have now become relevant in biology. OK, so that's interesting. The computer was really the pivotal tool that's right. for this, because you can feed in lots of numbers and get out a lot more. That's right. Um, tell me how this relates to this issue of noise. You, 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 part of what you do is you use noise to help regularize systems or bring order to systems, which sounds like a contradiction, it that does. you would bring a chaotic element like noise in, and it would help bring order. Could you explain that and give us some examples? Sure. So what we've primarily been doing in noise for the last 10 years or so is using it to go after a nonlinear phenomenon known as, a, known as a threshold. So a threshold would be, for example, a case where you might not feel a signal mm. that's too weak. So if I say press on your fingertip, uh, I might need to press with at least, say, half a gram of load for you to sense that I'm pressing on your fingertip. If I press below half a gram of load, you don't sense I'm pressing on your fingertip, say, if I have you close your eyes. Mm -hmm. If I go above that, you can now sense it. Mm -hmm. What we've been able to do with the noise is use the noise to actually boost the signal up over threshold. So whereas in the past, we would think of noise as being detrimental for detecting a signal or for transmitting information. So when we were growing up, we had analog radio, so you would tune the static out by twisting your knob. We would tune the uh, knob around on the TV to get rid of the snow on the screen. In that case, noise was bad. Yeah. You generally didn't want to have noise, in that case, being kind of static or random signal. Nowadays, it's with, say, cell phones. You don't like it if you have a little bit of static, you'd have a bad reception. We challenge that notion. This, as you indicate, it's kind of counterintuitive, where we say noise is good. Let's put it into neurons, our sensory neurons that could detect signals, as a means to make them more sensitive to go after signals they previously couldn't get. Okay, and make them more sensitive. 
So how does that work exactly? So uh, with the mechanical noise, which would be vibration, it basically serves as a pedestal. So again, now let's imagine I hit your fingertip with, say, uh, uh, just a little under half gram of load and with a varying signal. That will not cause your neurons to fire. But if I now add a little bit of noise, every once in a while, it will now cause that neuron to fire. And you can now sense a signal that you previously couldn't sense. And why it becomes relevant is that we all have threshold-based neurons in our bodies. But these thresholds change with age and with disease. So whereas if you're 20 years old, it might be half a gram of load. If you're 65 years old, it might now be five grams of load needed for you to sense something that's on your fingertip. It's not simply only at your fingertip, however, it's also on the soles of your feet or how you sense where your limbs are in space. And as a result of these age-related elevations in threshold, and mm. as a result of decline in sensory function, older people have major problems in interacting in their environment. They can't sense where their feet are on the ground. They can't control how their limbs are moving when they're going up or down stairs, which as a result, leads to real major balance difficulties. So the noise can be filtered out or used at, depending upon the needs of the particular system? That's right. So what we've done is actually develop medical devices that intentionally introduce noise mm -hmm. to basically soup up the human body. Okay. So whereas most engineering efforts, you get rid of noise, right? You'll pay a little extra for a cell phone with good Right. reception or radio that has so really good detection. with stroke patients, for example, that's an area you've worked in. That's right. Give, is that an area where this has been helpful Absolutely. in terms of helping so, uh, get the motor activity back and the speech as that's well? That's right. So yeah. primarily we focused on motor activity. Mm -hmm. So with stroke, you'll have a, a clot, for example, that will block blood from going to a portion of your brain for some period of time. It will kill the neurons in that part of your brain. As a result, you will typically have hemiparesis. So you will lose control and sensation, say, on half of your body. Mm -hmm. With stroke rehab, what will happen is that they'll take the patient, work them through a number of exercises in the hope of the sensory feedback, so information from their affected side, going back to the brain and effectively rewiring the brain, so forming new connections. The challenge is, is that often it's difficult to get a lot of information from the periphery, your limbs, mm -hmm. to your brain in suitable time to actually get suitable functional recovery. And what we've been able to show is that if you deliver noise mm. in the form of mechanical vibration or electrical noise to the subject, you can actually boost up the sensory input that now allows a stroke patient to recover faster mm. and to recover with increased function by essentially boosting how much information they're getting from their limb, which could be an arm or a leg, back to the brain. And that's been used now with stroke patients? It has. Or is it simply in, uh, in these uh, experimental So it's in clinical trials yeah. right mm -hmm. now. Uh, we similarly have developed vibrating insoles. So going back to the elderly challenge, that as your thresholds get elevated, by the time you hit about 65, your sensory neurons really begin to break down in a pretty dramatic fashion, leading to challenges with balance and locomotion. So the numbers are staggering. About one out of three individuals over the age of 65 fall each year. About 15 to 20 percent of these falls result in serious injury. So in fact, when they survey older people, their number one fear is not dying, it's falling. Mm. And what we've been able to show is that if you develop vibrating insoles, they can deliver very weak, in fact, subcentry mechanical noise or vibration that they can't feel. Yeah. We can actually significantly improve their balance, so much so we can take a 75-year-old and have the balance as well as a 20-year-old. Really? So how does this actually manifest itself? How would the, this, the patient be responding to this, feeling this? So they actually would not feel it, which is rather odd and, again, somewhat counterintuitive. So the body responds. But the body is responding. So you have... These sensors, they're on the soles of your feet, they're really distributed all around your body to sense either pressure, temperature, stretch. And what we're doing is re-biasing those sensors. So by delivering the noise, we shift their thresholds so that now 75-year-old Mrs. McGillicuddy has a detection threshold that's similar to, say, a 20-year-old Drexel University student. Uh -huh, and this is automatic. But this these are automatic. sensors that are applied to the skin. Yeah. So we apply devices to the skin mm -hmm. to basically trick the body's natural sensors. Mm. And we've done it on the insoles, we've done it at the ankle, we've done it at the knee, we've done it all along the lower limbs and seen pretty substantial gains. That is quite extraordinary yeah. because it is true that falling is a great fear of elderly It is elderly a huge people. fear and there's really not much to, yeah. that's available. You have canes, you have walkers, uh -huh. and most people are very scared about losing their independence. Mm -hmm. So if they fall, they commonly break their hip. Now when will this be available? To so we uh, uh, had originally licensed it to Afrin Corporation, a company we had started. Much of their technology uh, was acquired by Stryker Corp. And with Boston University, we were able to get back some of the vibrating insole technology. And we're now working with the Wies Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard 
and our hope is in the next nine months or so to have have something uh, on the have device prototypes ready. Okay, so that's not then, on the market. It's not on yet. the market yet. Okay. It's probably on the order of about a year and a half. Okay, because I think people watching the show will probably some of them will want to. Go I out suspect and get they that. will. Yeah. Um, also, I think uh, does is this related to some of the work that you've been doing also in heart with heart arrhythmias? It is. So in 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 the heart world, what we've done is use nonlinear dynamics in order to try to control arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is that if you go into ventricular fibrillation, yeah. uh, essentially the lower chambers of your heart will begin to beat in an, eighth, in, an, in an uncontrolled fashion such that you're not getting the blood pumped in the way that you should. Mm -hmm. And as a result, if you've shifted into V-fib or ventricular fibrillation, you need to have somebody get paddles onto your chest relatively quickly or you're dead. Yeah, and that's traumatic. It's highly traumatic. So what happens if, if you're prone to going into V-fib or if your heart's broken down such that you have a high risk for it, they'll implant a defibrillator. Yeah. And this uh, will deliver a huge amount of energy if it senses that you're going into ventricular fibrillation to reset your heart. Right. Uh, it's very painful. Yeah. Uh, it's been uh, basically said to be equivalent to having a bowling ball drop from a one-story building onto your chest or to be kicked in the chest by right. a Right, I know people who have had it, and right. they've yeah. said that Neither it is not fun. Have it. And, yeah. and now there's increasing studies on looking at uh, essentially post-traumatic stress. Mm, in patients really? with the defibrillator, worrying that it's going to go off when maybe sure, they just get excited sure. watching the Celtics on TV. <laughs> and so there's a real need, could we develop techniques that could use much less energy, yeah. delivering much uh, less trauma to the heart. And what we developed, David Cressini in my lab, who's a PhD student and now a faculty at Cornell Med, we developed techniques based on nonlinear control theory, chaos theory, mm -hmm. that could basically tickle the heart with small amounts of perturbation while it's trying to go into these bad rhythms and to keep them out of the bad rhythm and back to the healthy rhythm. That's interesting, though, that you use chaos to bring about a, a balance or a regularity. That's right. Uh, it sounds paradoxical. It is. You know, chaos, we generally, uh, yeah. non-scientists would think of chaos as utter confusion or disorder. Mm -hmm. Within the science world, the math world, it's, it's, it's a little different. It's, it's this idea that you can have a deterministic system exhibit seemingly random behavior, but as a result of the nonlinearity, they have these behaviors that seem to kind of go all over the place. Mm -hmm. But we are able to basically exploit some of the features of chaos to shift these bad rhythms back to healthy rhythms. Hmm. And so it is, it is a bit paradoxical, but it's worked quite well. We, we did initially computer studies, and then we did work with rats, uh, which is rabbits, and then David recently completed a study with humans and got brilliant work. So again, result. this is in the stage. It's in early stages. kind of clinical trials. Okay, but you are working toward making this available. This exactly. would take what form? This would be. This would be the form of a defibrillator. Oh, it would. But so it would be, be basically a kind of a pre-defibrillator. Mm -hmm. So it'd be an implantable device that would not deliver this huge shock once you go into much more gentle. But much gentle sensing as you're going into, say, the pattern which may preclude hmm. you to V-fib to keep you out of it. I know another area that you've worked in has to do with. Uh, analyzing the gates of animals. Yeah. Um, the trot and gallop of horses, for example, and the weird gait of six-legged bugs. Right. Tell me about that and what you see as the eventual application. I assume it has to do with balance. So it actually has to do with, with controlling, uh, for example, leg robots hmm. would be the actual application. So with Ian Stewart, who's a mathematician in England, when I was a graduate student, we began to study these, again, from a nonlinear dynamic standpoint. Mm -hmm. So what we did was uh, model the networks of neurons you have in your spinal cord that can control locomotion as basically sets of nonlinear elements. So what's interesting is that we generally think of locomotion, uh, human locomotion, animal locomotion, as coming completely from the brain. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what's been shown is that you can cut the spinal cord of a legged animal and hold that animal over a treadmill. And even though the legs now are no longer receiving any signals from the brain, the animal can actually produce leg locomotion, say going from a walk to a trot to a, mm. to a gallop in the case of a, of a horse. And with Ian, we modeled 